What he carried to her he carried in a red string bag. Through its mesh could be seen the gleam and tangle of new wire, a package of wood screws, a green plastic soda bottle, a braided brown coil of human hair, a wig. It could have been a wig. To get to her he had come a long way, from a very large city through smaller cities to eventide, not a city at all, or even a town, just the nearest outpost of video store and supermarket, gas and ice and cigarettes. The man at the stop-and-go had directions to her place, a map he had sketched himself. He spoke as if he had been there many times. It's just a little place, really, just a couple rooms, living room and a workshop. There used to be a garage out back, but she had it knocked down. The man pointed at the handmade map. There was something wrong with his voice, cancer, maybe, a sound like bones in the throat. He did not look healthy. It's just this feeder road all the way down? That's right. Takes about an hour, hour and ten. You can be there before dark if you... Do you have a phone? Oh, I don't have a number. And anyway, you don't call first. You just drive on down there and... A phone, the man said. He had not changed his tone. He had not raised his voice. But the woman sorting stock at the back of the store half rose, gripping like a brick a cigarette carton. The man behind the counter lost his smile and... Right over there, he said pointing past the magazine rack, bright with tabloids, with Playboy and nasty girls and jugs. He lit a cigarette while the man made his phone call, checked with a wavering glance the old Remington 870 beneath the counter. But the man finished his call, paid for his bottled water and sunglasses, and left in a late-model pickup, sober blue, a rental probably, and— I thought, said the woman with the cigarette cartons, that he was going to try something. So did I, said the man behind the counter. The glass doors opened to let in heat and light, a little boy and his tired mother, a tropical punch slush puppy, and a loaf of Wonder Bread. Allison, the man said into the phone, it's me. A pause. No sound at all, no breath, no sigh. He might have been talking to the desert itself. Then, where are you, she said. What do you want? I want one of those boxes, he said, the ones you make. I'll bring you everything you need. Don't come out here, she said, but without rancor. He could imagine her face, its Goya coloring, the place where her eye had been. Don't bring me anything. I can't do anything for you. See you in an hour, the man said. An hour and ten. He drove the feeder road to the sounds of Mozart, Forty's show tunes, flashy Tex-Mex pop. He drank bottled water. His throat hurt from the air conditioning. A flayed, unchanging ache. Beside him sat the string bag, bulging loose and uneven, like a body with a tumor, many tumors, like strange fruit, like a bag of gold from a fairy tale. The hair in the bag was beautiful, a thick and living bronze like the pelt of an animal, a thoroughbred, a beast prized for its fur. He had braided it carefully, with skill and a certain love, and secured it at the bottom with a small blue plastic bow. The other items in the bag he had purchased at a hardware store just like he used to, the soda bottle he had gotten at the airport, and emptied in the men's room sink. There was not much scenery, unless you liked the desert, its lunar space, its brutal endlessness. The man did not. He was a creature of cities, of pocket parks and dull anonymous bars, of waiting rooms and holding cells, of emergency clinics, of pain. In the beige plastic box beneath the truck's front seat there were no less than eight different pain medications— some in liquid form, some in pills, some in patches. On his right bicep now was the vague itch of a fentanyl patch. The doctor had warned him about driving while wearing it. There might be some confusion, the doctor said, along with the sedative effect. Maybe a headache, too. A headache, the man had repeated. He thought it was funny. Don't worry, doctor. I'm not going anywhere. Two hours later he was on a plane to New Mexico. Right now the fentanyl was working, but only just— he had an assortment of patches in various amounts, twenty-five, fifty, one hundred milligrams, so he could mix and match them as needed until he wouldn't need them any more. Now Glenn Gould played Bach, which was much better than fentanyl. He turned down the air conditioning and turned the music up loud, dropping his hand to the bag on the seat, fingers worming slowly through the mesh to touch the hair. They brought her what she needed, there in the workshop. They brought her her life. Plastic flowers, fraying T-shirts, rosaries made of shells and shiny gold, 
school pictures, wedding pictures, wedding rings, books, surprising how often there were books, address books, diaries, romance novels, murder mysteries, Bibles. One man even bought a book he had written himself, a ruffled stack of printer paper tucked into a folding file. Everything to do with the boxes she did herself. She bought the lumber, she had a lathe, the workbench, many kinds and colors of stain and varnish. It was important to her to do everything herself. The people did their part by bringing the objects, the baby clothes and car keys, the whiskey bottles and Barbie dolls. The rest was up to her. Afterwards they cried, some of them deep tears, strange and bright in the desert, like water from the rock. Some of them thanked her, some cursed her, some said nothing at all but took their boxes away, to burn them, pray to them, set them on a shelf for everyone to see, set them in a closet where no one could see. One woman had sold hers to an art gallery, which had started no end of problems for her out there in the workshop, the problems imported by those who wanted to visit her, interview her, question her about the boxes and her methods and motives for making them. Totems, they called them, or Rorschach boxes, called her a shaman of art, a priestess, a doctor with a hammer and an uncanny eye. They excavated her background, old pains exposed like bones. They trampled her silence, disrupted her work, and worst of all, they sicked the world on her. A world of the sad and the needy, the desperate, the furious and lost. In a very short time it became more than she could handle, more than anyone could handle, and she thought about leaving the country, about places past the border that no one could find, but in the end settled for a period of hibernation, then moved to eventide and point south. The older, smaller workshop, the bleached and decayed garage that a man with a bulldozer had kindly destroyed for her. She had made him a box about his granddaughter, a box he had cradled as if it were the child herself. He was a generous man. He wanted to do something to repay her, although no one, he said, petting the box, could pay for this. There ain't no money in the world to pay for this. She took no money for the boxes, for her work. She never had. Hardly anyone could understand that. The woman who had sold hers to the gallery had gotten a surprising price, but money was so far beside the point there was no point in even discussing it, if you had to ask, and so on. She had money enough to live on, the damages had bought the house, and besides, she was paid already, wasn't she? Paid by the doing, in the doing, paid by peace and silence, and a certain knowledge of help. The boxes helped them, always, sometimes the help of comfort, sometimes the turning knife, but Sometimes the knife was what they needed. She never judged. She only did the work. Right now she was working on a new box, a clean steel frame to enclose the life inside. Her life. She was making a box for herself. Why? And why now? But she didn't ask that. Why was the one question she never asked. Not of the ones who came to her. Not now of herself. It was enough to do it. To gather the items. Let her hand choose between this one and that a hair clip shaped like a feather, a tube of desert dirt, a grimy nail saved from the wrecked garage, a photo of her mother, her own name in newsprint, a hospital bracelet snipped neatly in two. A life was a mosaic, a picture made from scraps. Her boxes were only pictures of that picture and whatever else they might be or become, totems, altars, fetish, objets. They were lives first, a human ark in miniature, a precy of pain and wonder made of homely odds and ends. Her head ached from the smell of varnish, from squinting in the sawdust flume, from the heat. She didn't notice. From the fragments on the table before her, the box was coming into life. He thought about her as he drove. The fentanyl seemed to relax him, stretch his memories like taffy, warm and ropey, pull at his brain without tearing it, as the pain so often did. Sometimes the pain made him do strange things. Once he had tried to drink boiling water. Once he had flung himself out of a moving cab. Once he woke blinking on a restaurant floor, something hard jammed in his mouth, an EMS tech above him. About swallowed his tongue, the tech said to the restaurant manager, who stood watching with sweat on his face. People think that's just a figure of speech, you know, but they wrong. He had been wrong himself a time or two, about his own stamina, the state of his health, about her, certainly. He had thought she would die easily. She had not died at all. He had thought she could not see him, but even with one eye she picked him out of a lineup, identified him in the courtroom, that long finger pointing, 
accusing, dismissing all in one gesture, wrist arched like a bullfighter's before he places the killing blade, like a dancer's entointe, poised to force truth out of air and bone. With that finger she said who he was and everything he was not. Mene, mene, tekalu farsin. It was possible to admire such certainty. And she spared herself nothing. He admired her for that, too. Every day in the courtroom, before the pictures the prosecutor displayed, terrible Polaroids, all gristle and ooze, police tape and matted hair, but she looked, she listened carefully to everything that was said, and when the foreman said, Guilty, she listened to that, too. By then the rest of her hair had come in, just dark brown down at first, but it grew back as luscious before. Beautiful hair. It was what he had noticed first about her, in the bar, the blue monkey, filled with art school students and smoke, the smell of cheap lager. He had tried to buy her a drink, but no thanks, she had said, and turned away. Not one of the students, one of his usual prey, she was there and not. There at the same time, just as she was in his workshop later. There to the wire and the scalping knife, not there to the need in his eyes. In the end he had gotten nothing from her, and he admired her for that too. When he saw the article in the magazine, pure chance, really, just a half-hour's numb distraction, bright horizons in the doctor's office, one of the doctors, he could no longer tell them apart, he felt in his heart an unaccustomed emotion, gratitude. Cleaved from him as the others had been, relegated to the jail of memory, but there she was, alive and working in the desert, in a workshop filled with tools that, did she realize, he himself might have used, working in silence and diligence on that which brought peace to herself and pure release to others. They were practically colleagues, though he knew she would have resisted the comparison. She was a good one for resisting, the one who got away. He took the magazine home with him. The next day he bought a map of New Mexico and a new recording of Glenn Gould. She would have been afraid if it were possible, but fear was not something she carried. It had been stripped from her, scalped from her, in that room with the stuttering overheads, the loud piano music and the wire. Once the worst has happened, you lose the place where the fear begins. What's left is only scar tissue, like old surgery, like the dead pink socket of her eye. She did not wait for him, check the roads anxiously for him, call the police on him. The police had done her precious little good last time. They were only good for cleaning up, and she could clean up on her own. Now, here in the workshop, here where the light fell empty, hard and perfect, where she cut with her exacto knife a tiny scrolling segment from a brand new Gideon Bible, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Her hand did not shake as she used the knife. The light made her brown hair glow. The man at the stop-and-go gave good directions. Already he could see the workshop building, the place where the garage had been. He wondered how many people had driven up this road as he did, heart high, carrying what they needed, what they wanted her to use. He wondered how many had been in pain as he was in pain. He wondered what she said to them, what she might say to him now. Again he felt that wash of gratitude, that odd embodied glee. Then the pain stirred in him like a serpent, and he had to clench his teeth to hold the road. When he had pulled up beside her workshop, he paused in the dust his car had raised to peel off the used patch and apply a fresh one, a small one, one of the twenty-five milligrams. He did not want to be drowsy or distracted. He did not want sedation to dilute what they would do. He looked like her memories, the old bad dreams, yet he did not. In the end he could have been anyone, any aging tourist with false new sunglasses and a sick man's careful gait, come in hope and sorrow to her door. In his hand he held a red string bag. She could see some of what was inside. She stood in the doorway, waiting, the exacto knife in her palm. She did not wish he would go away, or that he had not come. Wishing was a vice she had abandoned long ago, and anyway the light here could burn any wish to powder. It was one of the desert's greatest gifts. The other one was solitude. And now they were alone. Allison, he said, you're looking good. She said nothing. A dry breeze took the dust his car had conjured. The air was clear again. She said nothing. I brought some things, he said, raising the bag so she could see. The wires, the bottle, the hair. Her hair. For the box, I mean. I read about it in a magazine, about you, I mean. 
Those magazines, like a breadcrumb trail, would he have found her without one? Wanted to find her? Made the effort on his own? Like the past to the present, one step leading always to another, and the past rose in her now, another kind of cloud. She did not fight it, but let it rise. Knew it would settle again as the dust had settled. And it did. He was still watching her. He still had both his eyes, but other things were wrong with him, his voice for one, and the way he walked, as if stepping directly onto broken glass, and— "'You don't ask me,' he said, "'how I got out.' "'I don't care,' she said. "'You can't do anything to me.' "'I don't want to. "'What I want,' gesturing with the bag, his shadow reaching for her as he moved, "'is for you to make a box for me, like you do for other people.' Make a box of my life, Allison. No answer. She stood watching him as he had watched him in the courtroom. The breeze lifted her hair as if in reassurance. He came closer. She did not move. I'm dying, he said. I should have been dead already. I have to wear this, touching the patch on his arm. To even stand here talking, you can't imagine the pain I'm in. Yes, I can, she thought. Make me a box as he raised the bag to eye level. Fruit, tumor, sack of gold. She saw its weight in the way he held it. Saw him start as she took the bag from him, red string damp with sweat from his grip, and— I told you on the phone, she said. I can't do anything for you. She set the bag on the ground. Her voice was tired. You'd better go away now. Go home or wherever you live. Just go away. "'Remember my workshop?' he said. Now there was glass in his voice, glass and the sound of the pain. Whatever was in that patch wasn't working any more. Grotesque, that sound, like a gargoyle's voice, like the voice of whatever was eating him up. "'Remember what I told you there? Because of me you can do this, Allison. Because of what I did, what I gave you. Now it's your turn to give to me. I can't give you anything.' she said. Behind her, her workshop stood solid, doorframe like a box frame, holding, enclosing her life, the life she had made, piece by piece, scrap by scrap, pain and love and wonder. The boxes, the desert, and he before her now was just the bad dream man, less real than a dream, than the shadow he made on the ground. He was nothing to her, nothing, and I can't make something from nothing she said. Don't you get it? All you have is what you took from other people. You don't have anything I can use. His mouth moved, jaw up and down like a ventriloquist dummy's, because he wanted to speak, but couldn't, because of the pain. Which pain? And here, she said, not because she was merciful, not because she wanted to do good for him, but because she was making a box, because it was her box she reached out with her long, strong fingers, reached with the exacto knife, and cut some threads from the bag, red string, thin and sinuous as veins, and, I'll keep these, she said, and closed her hand around them, said nothing as he looked at her, kept looking through the sunglasses. He took the sunglasses off, and, I'm dying, he said finally, his voice all glass now, a glass organ pressed to a shuddering cord, but she was already turning, red threads in her palm, closing the door between them, so he was left in the sun, the dying sun. Night comes quickly in the desert. She wondered if he knew that. He banged on the door, not long or fiercely. A little later she heard the truck start up again, saw its headlights, heard it leave, but by then she had already called the state police. A sober courtesy, a good citizen's compunction, because her mind was busy elsewhere was on the table with a bracelet and the varnish, the Gideon Bible and the red strings from the bag. She worked until the trooper came out to question her, then worked again when he had gone, her fingers calm on the knife and the glue gun on the strong steel frame of the box. When she slept that night she dreamed of the desert, of long roads and empty skies, her workshop in its center lit up like a burning jewel. As she dreamed, her good eye roved beneath its lid like a moon behind the clouds. In the morning paper it explained how and where they had found him, and what had happened to him when they did. But she didn't see it. She was too far even from eventide to get the paper any more. The trooper stopped by that afternoon to check on how she was doing. She told him she was doing fine. That man's dead, he said. Stone dead. You don't have to worry about him. 
Thank you, she said. Thank you for coming. In the box, the red strings stretched from top to bottom, from the bent garage nail to the hospital bracelet, the Bible verse to the Polaroid, like roads marked on a map to show the way.